Hmm. Yeah, I think it is done. It is coming. Webinar is now. Yeah, okay. Now it's on. Yeah, okay. Let me just finish okay. setting it up. So I put this link on my home page so it's live on there. At the same time, it's on the, the website, Neurosurgical TV. And this way, all the followers get a notice right now, 20,000 followers of the YouTube channel will get a notice that we're going live. So, okay, very good, okay. Here we go, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting a new series of 12 webcasts on neuroendoscopy with Dr. Waya Yadav. And I'll turn it right, up, right over to uh, Dr. Narayan Swami, who's going to give a proper neurosurgical introduction. Welcome, Narayan. Hello, Narayan. Are you there? Yeah, good evening to you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so we are blessed today to have Professor Yadav, who is pioneer of endoscopic surgery and who has taught endoscopy to almost all neurosurgeons in India. More than 850 students have blessed by him. And he's going to speak on various topics today, starting with, you know, the disparing micro discectomy is one of his innovations. So we welcome you, Yadav, sir. Please take over and then please kindly go ahead, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Narayan Swami, and uh, thank you, Sir uh, John, for giving me this opportunity to share my views. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, is that all right? Yes, perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. So today I'll be talking about endoscopic anterior approach in the cervical disc disease. And this is a disc preserving surgery. Uh, and the anterior cervical decompression and fusion, that is ACDF, is the standard surgical procedure for cervical disc diseases, which we have been doing for quite a long. And it is uh, still considered to be good. This is quite effective and safe. Um, even the artificial discs uh, have come uh, and uh, it was in fashion for some time, um, uh, but uh, there are uh, long-term results of artificial discs. Um, there is a fusion, uh, so therefore the preservation of the motion segment does not occur in the long-term uh, follow. Um, also, uh, the limitations of ACDF, that is the most popular treatment modalities available for cervical disc, mm -hmm. is that there is a loss of disc height when you do ACDF. There, is, uh, there are chances of pseudoarthrosis. There is a degeneration of adjacent segment because you fuse one segment. So these are the limitations. The endoscopic anterior uh, disc um, uh, is a disc preserving surgery in which most of the uh, natural disc uh, uh, is left out on and only a small portion of the disc is removed. And this has been uh, found to be very effective and safe uh, in uh, radiculopathy and myelopathy. Uh, and this has been found in uh, various publications from uh, us starting from 2014. Uh, we have published our reports. And there are um, other authors also who have shown that uh, this endoscopic disc preserving surgery is quite safe and effective. Uh, the advantage of endoscopic anterior um, uh, cervical discectomy over ACDF is that it preserves most of the natural disc 
So only a small portion of the disc, natural disc, which is given by the God is, um, is removed uh, for decompression and most of it uh, is there. So it preserves most of the disc. There is no fusion required. Uh, it preserves uh, motion segment and there is no manipulation of the nerve root or the cord uh, because uh, the compressing uh, force is lying anteriorly as against when you go for posterior approach. Now, the word about uh, the indication when should you choose anterior approach or the posterior approach, I think for that we should look at this diagram. Um, you see this is the cord, cervical cord, and these are the roots. So any compression which is coming from the anterior side, uh, which could be there because of the disc prolapse or because there is a degenerative process involving uncovertable joint um, uh, with the osteophyte, uh, which is compressing on the root, or there may be any osteophyte from the end plate or from the vertebral body. So if there is any compression which is coming from anterior side of the cord or the root, then the ideal approach is the anterior approach. And if you can do it uh, by endoscopy, it is best because it is a minimally invasive technique. Uh, whereas, uh, if the compression is from the posterior side, for example, if there is a hypertrophy of the facet joint, when there is a degeneration of the facet joint, it gets hypertrophied. And in such case, the compression comes from the posterior side. So if the compression is from the posterior side, we should go from the posterior side. Uh, or if there's a ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, in that case also, it is better to come from the posterior side. Um, but if there is a soft disc, uh, which is within five millimeter of the lateral margin of the dura, although the compression is from the anterior side because the disc is uh, from the anterior side, but since it is a soft disc, uh, just by uh, retraction of the root, uh, you can take out the soft disc. So it is only indicated when there's a lateral disc within five millimeter of the dural margin, and then you can remove it from the posterior approach also. Uh, and it has also advantage and some limitations because you, you don't damage the disc at all. So um, this is these are in general. Regarding the indications for um, endoscopic approach, when you have significant anti-compression, which produces radiculopathy or myelopathy, or myeloradiculopathy. And in case of radiculopathy, when the conservative treatment fails. Uh, so if the compression is because of the disc or because of the osteophyte coming from the vertebral body, or there is a, a thick posterior longitudinal ligament which is pressing onto the cord or the, the root, in such case, you can take uh, anti approach and the endoscopic approach. It can be done at single level and uh, even at two level. Uh, regarding the contraindications, um, um, when there is a significant posterior compression, uh, for example, if there is a ligamentum phlegm hypertrophy or the facet joint hypertrophy, in that case, one should not go from the anterior side, you should take a posterior uh, approach. Uh, if there is a congenital canal stenosis, then also it is a contraindication. Uh, there is a significantly reduced disc height uh, with foramenal stenosis. So there can be conditions in which the disc height has been significantly reduced. And in that case, the foramenal stenosis is there because of the settling down of the disc. So such case, um, it is better to increase the disc height by putting in graft. So in that case, ACDF is a better option. Um, the compression uh, opposite to the mid vertebral level, uh, or if the compression is against the whole vertebral body. Mm -hmm. So if the compression is at the disc level, then you go for endoscopic surgery. But if the compression is, is there involving 
the whole vertebral body apart from the disc itself, then you require more drilling of the vertebral body and it is not uh, favorable. Although one can do a transcorporal approach, which I'll discuss later on. So some variations of this approach can be done, but uh, by and large, if the, if the compression is um, against the vertebral body involving whole length, then it is better to remove that vertebral body uh, to remove the compression and go for the grafting. And if there is a disc migration, either a cranial migration or caudal migration, and if the migration is involving more than the half vertebral body height, in that case also you require too much of drilling of the vertebral body. So it is better to uh, go either transcorporal or go for um, uh, the vertebrectomy and use a graft. And if there is unstable spine, then also it is not advisable to go for just removal of the disc. You can remove the disc and also you have to go for the uh, fusion. The relative contraindications are when there's more than two level uh, involved. Uh, although we have not done, but uh, it can be done. It takes more time. And uh, there can be situations when there is a double layer sign that means there is a, a one hyperdensity because of the posterior margin of the vertebral body, and there is an intradural ossified posterior longitudinal ligament. And this hypodensity is uh, of the dura. So you have dura in between, and there is um, another hyperdensity which suggests that there is an intradural. Uh, ossified posterior longitudinal ligament. So in that case, if you do this approach, then there are more chances of CSF leak. So better avoid it. Um, the previous operation at the same level, there will be a lot of adhesions. So this is also relate, relative contraindication. Um, so you have to... Uh, regarding the, uh, uh, reg sorry, regarding the approaches, one can have uh, uh, approach through the disc space. So you can go through the disc um, and it can be there from the center. If the compression is there at the center of the disc, producing myelopathy, and you can also go from the lateral side if uh, it is producing only a myelopathy. But if there is a migration of the disc cranially or caudally, then you can go from the vertebral body. So this is known as transcorporal. This is one example of such case in which there is a uh, migration of the disc. Um, so you can go through the vertebral body and remove the portion of the disc which is compressing the cord or uh, the root. So various approaches could be through the disc and adjoining vertebral body which could be central or it could be lateral or you can go through the vertebral body and without disturbing the disc at all you, you can remove the uh, compressing element. Uh, from the unilateral approach also, it has been advocated that by angling the endoscope and using the, the curved instrument, you can uh, remove most of the compression from the anterior side. But if there is a central compression, I take the central route, which I'll discuss, which is far better. And you can go for bilateral good decompression. Uh, regarding the surgical technique, um, uh, one should use C arm for localization before you start the skin incision because your incision has to be dot at the place where you want to operate. So use uh, the localizers, various commercially available uh, localizers are available or you can use simple um, C shape, uh, some metal uh, to find out uh, where the disc is, the culprit disc is there. <coughs> Sorry. The general anesthesia is given and about three centimeter skin incision is done, is given medial to the sternocleidomastoid. The neck is slightly extended, 
patient is supine with or without uh, traction and the uh, approach is from the symptomatic side. So if there is a right side symptoms, right side radiculopathy, then you go from the right side. If it is left side, then you go from the left side. Uh, but if it is central, um, then you can go from the right side if you are a right-handed person. So right side approach when there's a right side symptoms or when there is a symmetrical bilateral compression. So in that case also you can go from the right side or if the disc is migrated cranially. If the disc is migrated cranially for a right-handed person, it is better, I mean, it is easier to operate uh, cranially uh, from the right side. But if it is um, cordially migrated, then you should go from the left side. And if there's a left side symptom, obviously uh, the approach has to be from the left side. And this is the position. Um, all the steps of surgery are same as that of the standard anterior ACDF approach. So initial dissection up to the disc uh, is same. Uh, you can use uh, either a microscope or an open eye, or you can use exoscope or VTOM um, till you reach up to the disc space. And once you reach at the disc space and you, you confirm the level that it, this is the culprit disc, in, uh, there, there you uh, introduce a tubular retractor uh, and then after that, all the work uh, should be done under the endoscopic control. Uh, the correct level should be again identified by using a um, uh, LP needle, which is uh, uh, bent. Uh, so reconfirm the level. The small incision can be given at the disc, uh, which is a culprit disc, so that you don't miss that. Um, and then I have already discussed that you can take um, either a lateral approach if there is a uh, unilateral symptoms or if there are bilateral symptoms, then you take uh, the central approach, uh, which I'll show in one of the surgery, or you can take a transcorporal approach if there's a migration of the disc. Uh, here also we have shown that for central um, Bilateral symptoms, you go from the central side, but if it, there's a unilateral symptoms, then you uh, remove part of the disc, which is laterally, and remove the uh, uncinate process and uncus, that is the lateral part of the adjoining vertebral body. Uh, part of, I don't know how to remove that, uh, this part, it is coming. Uh, oh. This is coming up, obscuring my part of the. Um, so, how to? This thing, I don't know how to. Okay. Uh, so, the part of the disc and the adjoining bone is removed. Uh, and you have to remove uh, sufficient bone, about five to six mm um, uh, hole is made so that you can pass uh, two instrument, two thin instrument through that. Keep uh, a small part of the uncinate process intact to protect the vertebral artery uh, or, or its venous plexus if you take the lateral approach because that part will protect uh, vertebral artery injury and the venous plexus bleeding. So keep one to two millimeter of that bone intact. Um, the removal of that bone is not required. If you remove it, then it causes more uh, problems than doing any good or increasing any exposure. So I don't remove uh, one to two millimeter of the lateral part of the uncinate process. Uh, for complete removal of uh, bilateral compression, uh, one has to remove a small anterior part and the posterior part of the vertebral body, which I'll explain through the diagram, and use angled instrument, angled drill or angled curate, so that the complete decompression can be done, which I'll explain through the diagram. 
Uh, you also remove the posterior longitudinal ligament because at times there is a subligamental disc fragment. So always remove the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament. I always remove it uh, so that we don't miss any subligamental disc fragment. And if the ligamentum phlegm, obviously when it is thick, then it can also compress. So you need to remove that. So this is uh, the example uh, of how things can be improved. If there is a uh, bilateral compression in this case, so if you want to do endoscopic surgery and remove only a five millimeter or six millimeter of the through the uh, window, um, then if you use a straight uh, instrument, uh, you will uh, decompress up to here. And uh, from this side, if I uh, go, then I can decompress up to here. So only this much decompression is possible using a small incision. But if you drill a little bit of entry part of the vertebral body and also a little bit of posterior part of the vertebral body and use angled instruments. So these three things, drilling of little bit drilling of the anterior portion, little bit of drilling of the posterior portion and using an angle instruments, you can go and remove the, the full extent of uh, uh, the anterior compression uh, using only a small corridor of about five millimeter. Uh, so this is important and we must understand this. This is a small video just to show uh, the surgery, this is C45 uh, disc on the right side, the compression and now this was the central disc. Uh, so um, endoscopic control, the anterior portion of the soft tissue is coagulated and now using a drill, uh, some portion of the disc, which is central portion of the disc, and adjoining vertebral body portion is drilled until you uh, come across the, um, the end cartilage, posterior portion. So at that point, uh, one can use thin carison punch of one millimeter. There was some more uh, bone, so one should go for Excel drilling and at times I go, you see there is a movement of the soft tissue. That means the whole ant cartilage has been removed. And once you remove the whole uh, cartilage, after that you can use various blunt and sharp instrument to remove uh, the uh, soft tissue, the ant cartilage and the various compression, which may be osteophyte uh, or a soft disc. So in this case, this was a hard uh, sort of osteophyte, which was going and compressing the cord. So the, you can realize that this uh, tissue, which was compressing the cord has been delivered and then uh, angulating uh, your endoscope to right or left and cranial and caudal, one can go for complete decompression of the cord, including uh, the removal of, uh, I mean, decompression of the, um, uh, the roots. But you require the angulation of endoscope, cranial, caudal, to the right and to the left, and you have to use the angled drill and angled uh, curate to decompress it. You can see that uh, the white signing um, thickle sac was seen. Uh, so this is the end of the surgery, and after that, a small piece of abgel is put in, and then uh, incision is closed. So. Uh, I mean, same, the gauze pieces which were there, cranial, caudal, medial, lateral, uh, or on the right or left side uh, should be removed. So this was a small um, 
I mean corridor. So these are the example. This is the pre-operative right side C6, C7 lateral disc, uh, C6, C7 lateral disc pre-operative MRI, right side compression and post-op good decompression. And you can realize that the amount of bone removal is very small. So majority, most of the disc, um, normal disc has been uh, left intact. And this is another case. This is a central disc, C4, C5, central disc preoperatively with cord changes, central disc. And this is through the central approach. See, in the previous case, it was, the approach was from the lateral side. Now, because the compression was bilateral, and in the center, therefore I choose to go from the center. So uh, the amount of bone removal on the anterior side is small, but you can realize that anteriorly bone removal is less, but the posteriorly where the compression was there on the cord um, by angulating it cranially and cordially, the amount of bone removal um, near the cord is more. And that is what is required. And, and this is what um, give rise to complete improvement of patient symptoms. Um, regarding the alignment, these are the, uh, the x-rays after surgery. So cervical alignment is maintained after surgery, although there is uh, about one millimeter uh, disc height reduction, but in long term, um, this does not cause any problem. We have been doing this surgery for more than 10 years uh, and uh, no patient complained of any problem related to cervical alignment. So regarding the results of surgery, this was found to be safe and effective for myelopathy also and for radiculopathy. Uh, the most of the, uh, the reports which are available in the literature, they use uh, this endoscopic approach only for radiculopathy, but we are doing it uh, also for myelopathy and radiculopathy or myelopathy. Uh, over the last 10 years, we have done more than 1,000 cases. Uh, the complication may be few, very rare, uh, but you should know there could be hematoma, there could be esophageal injury. Fortunately, we did not come across any of these, except uh, in one case when some other surgeon was operating and there was a vertebral artery injury. And um, rarely you can have root uh, injury, neurological deterioration, and reoperation. So hardly any complication in our series, um, but uh, possibly this was there because of the good case selection. And we started doing cervical cases after about 10 years of experience in endoscopic surgery. So only after you gain sufficient experience, then you start with this. But there are limitations. There can be decrease in the disc height, but this does not alter the long-term results. So patient continue to do well, um, and there is no problem in kyphosis or uh, related to cervical alignment. Uh, there is a possibility of recurrence theoretically because you remove only a part of the disc the rest of the disc may, uh, may herniate, but since there's a lot of space available, so even if it herniates, it comes in that dead space and there's a difficult learning curve. Uh, we are conducting a one year university certified neuroendoscopy fellowship program, and we take three fellows every year. So anybody interested in endoscopic surgery, uh, can join these, uh, but there is an exam which is conducted by the university. And we also conduct one week neuroendoscopy fellowship training program um, every six monthly in the month of March and September. This we have been doing since last 15 years. Uh, for detail, you can go through uh, some of our article published um, in various journals like Neurology India, um, about uh, the anterior approach, disc sparing surgery, um, and in World Neurosurgery Journal, again in Neurology India, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the chapter in the book. 
this is what I was talking about. We have published a neuroendoscopy surgery book, uh, a comprehensive approach. Um, and in that book, the chapter number 17 is about the endoscopic anterior approach, cervical disc sparing uh, surgery, and where all the indication, contraindication, and all surgical nuances uh, have been very well covered. So to conclude, endoscopic decompression using anterior approach is effective alternative technique to decompress the cord and route up to two level. Uh, it is indicated in, uh, in significant uh, anterior compression when patient have either a radiculopathy or myelopathy or myeloradiculopathy, which is secondary to the disc or the osteophyte from vertebral body or the oncovertebral joint. Or if there's a thick OPLL and it can be done up to two level, but it is not indicated when there's an associated significant post compression, uh, secondary to ligamentum phlegm hypertrophy or the facet hypertrophy, or if the patient has a congenital canal stenosis, significantly reduced disc height with formal stenosis. In that case, you require um, widening of the disc space um, using a graft. And uh, the compression, uh, which is lying opposite to the mid uh, vertebral uh, body level. So if the compression is against the vertebral body, um, or not at the disc level, in that case, it is a relative contraindication. Um, and if the disc has been migrated or there is an unstable spine. The other limitation is that uh, although it is difficult to learn, so there is a learning curve, but once you learn it, then it is safe uh, once you have a su sufficient experience in the endoscopic surgery. I am thankful to my teachers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful lecture as ever. You have explained wonderfully how exactly, you know, what are the indications, what are the contraindications with a small incision, how exactly to go to address not only the radiculopathy, even the myelopathy and a new series, no complication. It's a wonderful job, sir. So now I invite the panelists to, you know, uh, throw more light on it and then the discuss if they have been associated with the surgery. So. I mean uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, no, no complication means that we have been doing the anterior cervical approaches um, uh, for so many years. So, uh, I mean, we had those complications in beginning of our learning curve in the ACDF cases. Um, some esophageal injury, I think one or two cases, but not when we started uh, because we had, we had sufficient experience before that. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, may I ask uh, Dr. Jitin Bajaj to give his views, you know, that it's a despairing, as Professor Yadav has said, you know, that, you know, that there is a likelihood of uh, the disc again prolapsing, you know, but uh, it hasn't happened. So it's a natural alternative for preserving the motion, your views on it. Thank you, sir. So it was a great lecture. I have uh, two questions on behalf of the junior colleagues. First is uh, the type of endoscope we use, uh, whether it is a zero degree or angled scope. And then uh, many people also ask, uh, what is uh, the difference between microscopic and endoscopic uh, cervical disc surgery? Yes. So the endoscope uh, which is used uh, is uh, a 10 degree endoscope. It is angled uh, scope we use Initially, we were using uh, Dest and set, but now we are using EasyGo system, but you can use any system. Any endoscopic uh, system can be used. Even zero degree endoscope can be used. So we use tubular retractor and then we uh, do surgery under the endoscopic control. So this was about this. Um, the other question was? Uh, 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 the difference between microscopic and endoscopic uh, cervical disc. I think uh, the visualization with the endoscope is better because illumination is excellent compared to microscope. But I agree that with the help of tubular retractor, 
uh, and uh, even with the microscope you can do uh, almost similar kind of uh, work but the angle visualization will be little inferior looking at the corner uh, um, with the microscope will be difficult um, the endoscope visualization is better as we know, all know but it can be done it can be done for simple case a uh, simple radiculopathy lateral disc you can use uh, microscope also but if there is a bilateral compression and you want to remove bilateral uh, decompression up to the root then possibly it will be difficult with the microscope yeah thank you thank you sir. yeah yeah can i ask dr shelan ratre to join in and then give his comments uh, yeah uh, thank you sir very uh, wonderful lecture sir and uh, i am assisting sir for um, around 10 years the uh, same cases and i have found that the uh, that sheath the tubular sheath which we used with this uh, system so it it is very well protective the surrounding structures are well protected in uh, in compa comparison when we use clovered in microscopic surgery so when uh, whether we use drill or uh, any uh, uh, quartry so it is very uh, protective to the surrounding structures and also the graft uh, uh, donor the graft site complications there there are no complications since we are not using graft in this uh, because it is disc preserving surgery so it is uh, other uh, very good benefit yeah so what i think uh, uh, professor salender is trying to say is that because there is a tube available, so therefore the chances of injury to the esophagus or surrounding structures are less, uh, or it doesn't occur at all. Um, and uh, because of the time constraint, uh, I did not mention that, that we put in uh, gauze piece cranially, cordially, medially, laterally, so that when you angulate your tubular retractor, the soft tissue does not come uh, in your way. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Dr. Shalender. Dr. Vijay Pariha, please join in. Your comments, please. Yes, good uh, evening. Am I, am I audible? Yeah. Well, yes, yes. So, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, sir. It's a, a wonderful lecture. Just want to ask a question that for radiculopathy, um, uh, have you ever gone to the contralateral uh, side? It has been said that with the endal, uh, angle endoscope, if you want to go uh, to do the root decompression, better to go from the uh, contralateral side. Yes, uh, it is mentioned and we tried in the beginning of uh, our surgery that you go from anterior side, uh, I mean, go from the uh, lateral side and then you can go Contralaterally, I think in one of my uh, slide also from lateral side you can angulate and uh, remove it uh, from the other side. But in doing so, you remove more of the disc. So therefore, I have given up that. So if there is a bilateral decompression, uh, if in any case bilateral decompression is required, then I go from the middle. I mean from the center, and then it is easier to reach. Uh, both the uh, roots uh, from there. See, when there is a central compression, then I take central root. Although it can be done, but uh, going from the lateral side, you are forced to remove more of the natural uh, disc uh, material. So therefore, uh, I did not, those people who uh, try to do that, uh, they advocate removal of the whole uh, uh, uncinate process. So once you remove whole of the uncinate process, then you can angulate it more uh, on the contralateral side. But in the process, there is a risk of uh, bleeding from the venous plexus, uh, from the vertebral artery. And also uh, when we have seen one vertebral artery injury, uh, when such thing was tried by some other uh, surgeon. So this is a risk which can be completely avoided if you leave one to two millimeter of uh, uncinate process bone intact over the lateral portion which will protect vertebral artery. Thank you, sir.
Thank you. I don't find any questions in the question or chat box. Uh, no, no, there are there are I think sufficient questions. Um, one question is: uh, Can single level corpectomy be performed by endoscopic approach? Yes. Uh, we uh, so there is another uh, another um, uh, presentation. The endoscopic corpectomy also can be done. We have done partial corpectomy using endoscope and we don't use any graft. Now we have started putting in some of the, the uh, chips of bone there and this has been found to be effective. But single level uh, corpectomy, partial corpectomy and two level disc removal can be done. I think there are uh, other uh, questions also. Uh, please see chat box. Not finding sign in my chat box. Only this much have come. Okay, I have some uh, more. I think um, someone is asking about the detail of fellowship. Okay, so uh, we have uh, the we have a site uh, of if you uh, just in the Google you go and uh, type the neuroendoscopy fellowship uh, program in India. Uh, uh, Jabalpur or neuroendoscopy, then you will find our fellowship program. This is one week fellowship uh, training program uh, is conducted every six monthly in which uh, about 15 live surgery of different type brain and spine live surgeries are done. And then uh, two days hands-on cadaveric workshop is uh, performed. So this is first come first serve. Um, uh, program, you can see the site and can apply there. But uh, when it is open, then uh, in about five to 10 days time, all the seats are full. So please uh, I mean, keep contacting people. And the, for one year fellowship program, it is the exam which is uh, 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 being conducted by the university. Uh, so you have to clear that exam. It's not very difficult. Usually for three seats, we have about um, uh, 15 to 18 candidate uh, applying for the fellowship program. It is a paid fellowship. Uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, the fellows are um, paid by the government. Um, I think 80,000 Indian rupees or something like that. So that is enough to take care of your expenditure in India. And you are uh, also allowed uh, the accommodation also. So Dr. Rajas Santos uh, is asking, we, most of them, uh, most of us are right-handed surgeons. Can it be done from left side, left hand, left side also, standing on the yes. left? Yes, yes, it can be done. When you have left side symptoms, then you have to come from the left side. So if there is a left side radiculopathy, you should always come from the left side. And if uh, if you are a left-handed uh, surgeon, then uh, uh, possibly um, uh, the caudal, I mean, accordingly, uh, if there is a cranial caudal migration uh, for a left-handed person, I don't know, um, from the left side, which one will be right side, will cranial migration will be better or something. I am a right-handed person. So for cranial migration, uh, the right-sided approach is better. For caudal migration, it is the left side. So accordingly, you can uh, decide. But if the symptoms are on the left side, then you come from the left side. Just a query, sir. Uh, some, sometimes a, a discal type of OPLL, can that, can that also be approached in the same this thing, microdiscectomy side? Yes, yes. OPLL... And yeah, even if even if it is uh, adherent to the dura, then also you can do anything which can be done by microscope can also be done by the endoscope. So you can drill the uh, osteophyte, you can drill it, and then you can dissect the OPLL. Sometimes the OPLL is densely adherent to the dura. So in that case, it is better to go for a floating technique. That means you disconnect uh, the OPLL from the vertebral body, the rest of the things, 
so in that case the 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 cord starts pulsating uh, rather than trying to forcefully detach it from the adherent dura so it can be done even we have been doing uh, the disc removal and putting in graft and putting in uh, screws and plates um, i mean uh, uh, you all know that uh, this we are doing also so fusion can also be done when there is an indication if there is an elisthesis or a trauma in that case the endoscopic disc removal and then we put in a spacer put in graft there and then uh, uh, pass in uh, one screw cranially and one quarterly and it works very well so it is you should have experience in uh, the open surgery. So most of the open surgery, which uh, if you can do open surgery, you can also do endoscopic surgery with the tube. Um, if the graft is not going th through the tube, then you can take out your tube, put in the graft there, and then you put the uh, tubular retractor and do your work. So though you told so very specifically that in up to two level it can be done, someone is asking if more level can be done by this. Up to two level we have done, so we have not tried more than uh, uh, two levels so far. But we have done uh, three level disc and two level corpectomies, partial corpectomies. So, um, if you are interested, you can uh, read one of our article. Um, uh, in neurology India, partial corpectomy endoscopic. So you can remove up to two vertebral body using endoscope. And obviously when you remove two vertebral body, you can uh, do three level disc uh, uh, decompression also quite effectively. And someone is asking, is there a, a requirement of a routine drain, sir? Requirement of? Routine drain. Drainage, uh, drain. Not, uh, because there's hardly any dead space, but if you think there is some ooze or something, then you can put in small uh, and drain. So routinely not required. We have a question from Harshad Parekh, a neurosurgeon from Mumbai. Go ahead, Harshad. Hello, sir. Professor Yadav. Sir, sir, sir. Excellent talk. As always, you are you are a very inspiring for us to learn more and more. And, uh, and you have shown how the cervical disc surgery has changed over a period of time and you have come to a minimally invasive. I started my learning my anterior cervical disc without fusion. And when in 85, 86, when I started, there were no implants available. And uh, we used to harvest uh, sometimes, then when we started fusing, harvest the bone from iliac crest and punch it there, graft will come out or migrate and all sorts of things. And I went to England and I started learning about the clovered and, and various things have come. When I came back to India, I designed my own edge plate, stainless steel, and put a plate. And now you have come out with the endoscope and despairing which is very, very important thing so you can avoid. The question is uh, why the, suppose you removed a partial disc, despairing is, although you are not saying despairing, but there is a, some amount of disc you are removing, which is causing a problem. Does it not cause problem of the residual disc that may herniate further? Do you find this problem ever? You have to no. devise the thing. Yes, sir. You are correct. I mean, theoretically, this, there is a possibility. One is that mm -hmm. when you remove, uh, although it is a disc sparing surgery, but some amount of disc is being removed. So there is about one millimeter on an average, one millimeter disc settlement is always there. So there is a reduction of the disc space post-operatively. Um, but it has not made any difference in the overall result, even in the long-term follow-up so far. Regarding the recurrence, um, uh, in the beginning, we had some uh, problem, one or two cases, but I think it was not a recurrence, it was an incomplete surgery. 
uh, what I feel that even if there is some herniation, theoretical possibility, it goes in the dead space, which is available. Uh, so the really, I mean, recurrence of the disc space uh, of <coughs> these, we have not come across uh, so far. Maybe some of these patients may have gone somewhere, but it is not a uh, issue. No, many a times I have seen when we are doing SEDF and if you leave some portion of a disc behind by mistake, as you have very rightly said, you have to open up the PLL. If you don't cut the PLL and expose the dura, you may at least leave the part of a small portion of a disc. Does it happen in later on? There's some disc is still there coming out, you know, like the nucleus purposes coming out there and this. No, sir. Uh, so no. that is what I do. I always remove uh, the PLL and then uh, try to search uh, in all cases. So uh, we don't try to leave any disc fragment, one thing during surgery, but post-operatively you are saying theoretical possibility of disc going there and uh, getting, uh, we have not come across that possibility. Possibly the reason may be that <coughs> There is a, uh, I mean, leftover uh, some dead space. So if even if there is some herniation, it um, it might come in that uh, the corridor, which is the dead space, which is left out of this surgery. Yeah. And about the side, right side or the left side, in my experience, of, I'm a right-handed person. I, I, I have no guts to go from the left side. To operate because I've never done it or once or twice I tried and didn't do well. And I found that even if you come from a right side, you can still decompress from the left side. Left side, you can still do it. You go on a left side of the disc from the right side only. When because ultimately your endoscope goes from the tube retractor after you are dissected out the disc space. You are you are opening a disc space until longitudinal ligament on the left side, from the right side, you can do it. And I found it, uh, it is reasonably comfortable. Maybe I'm not used to left side. I'm not denying that one should not go from a left side, but it's a le comfort level. And somebody asked, uh, or most of the neurosurgeons prefer to do from the right side. Dr. Harshad, sir, it's because of that article which is there, you know, that the chances of recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy is more if you do from yeah. right side. You find in Europe, yeah. everybody does from left side. So it's a question yeah. of getting used to it. That's another thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Other aspect, sir, uh, which is more important apart from the recurrent laryngeal and left and right handed surgeon, what is more important is the comparison is on the left side and producing radiculopathy. So if you come from the right side and go on to the opposite side, <coughs> you remove more of the normal disc which is not required. Whereas if you come from the left side, remove very little bit of uh, the adjoining disc and on the left side, you do the job and come out. So, uh, I mean, it is better, but it can be done from the right side also, yes. Yeah, thank you. Very nice, sir. Very nice. Very yes. stimulating. Thank you, thank sir. You. I find... John, I find no more questions over there. Okay, so, I don't see any more. Yeah. Okay, I guess uh, I guess we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much, Dr. Yadav, for starting uh, this series. And what is what is the um, topic for next week? Sir, I think it is colloid cyst. I am not sure. Uh, it it okay, is. Okay, we'll I, we'll announce I, it. We'll announce it. I think it is colloid cyst uh, uh, using tubular retractor. Um, I'll just check it. Uh, it is there. Uh, you have given this. Yeah, let me let me just get it right yes, now. Sir. All right, sir. Yeah. So it is uh, endoscopic uh, management of endoscopic excision of colloid cyst using tubular retractor. So it's right. also quite good, uh, and there are advantages of uh, the combination of endoscope and tubular retractor in colloid cyst for complete excision. So please do join. Very good. We had more than 60 panelists. I thank you a lot for that. And we look forward to next week. See you then.
thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, all panelists.